because we have a lot to cover today. And I'm sorry about the glare in my glasses. I'm going to try to, oh well, I guess we're getting used to these things. Okay, so this is my wine insider tip for uh, today. Now, yes, I want to bring your eyes right down to the bottom. And yes, it's $45. Uh, and that is a lot of money to pay for a bottle of wine. Uh, that said, if you have a special gift to give to somebody or you want to really, really splurge on a wonderful bottle of Napa Valley Chardonnay, this is it. Uh, it comes from a very specific area called the Spring Mountain District. Uh, those of you who ever watched Falcon Crest uh, may know that the mansion from Falcon Crest was actually the Spring Mountain Vineyards estate. Uh, but this is a very small uh, area in, you know, in the mountains uh, above Napa Valley. Uh, Smith Madrone is celebrating their 50th anniversary this year, which means that they were a newcomer to the old guard. Most of the old guard of Napa uh, is about 60 or 70 years old. Smith Madrone is now ce celebrating their 50th year. Uh, but this wine really exhibits everything that makes Napa Valley our most expensive and valuable agricultural land. It is so rich and round in the mouth and so texturous in the mouth but has this enlightening uh, acidity. Uh, there's a, a delicate lacing of oak, and it's just a delicious, wonderful wine to drink. Uh, I've, I've had it with uh, just simple cow's milk cheese and apples, all the way to a beef shish kebab. Uh, and it was rich enough, uh, especially with that little bit of oak, to really, really complement a red meat shish kebab. So, like I say, if you've got $45 sitting around and nothing better to do with it, uh, you know, I got to call them like I sees them. And this is a beautiful bottle of Chardonnay. Okay. Christine, let's see, let me see. Gallery. Okay, there you are. Okay, so now we're going to start uh, the Sherry of Spain. Uh, now, uh, y'all remember our four variables. And I always say that a region has to, has to utilize all variables. Uh, for instance, California always had the climate, always had the soil, and had a wine-growing culture with the missionaries, but we didn't have grapes. And so it wasn't until the grapes came to the New World that the California and the New World uh, vineyards blossomed. You've also heard me say that the most successful region to capitalize on the four variables is Champagne. But the Sherry region of Spain, uh, other than profitability, because uh, Champagne is so much more profitable, uh, other than Champagne, the Sherry region of Spain utilizes these four variables uh, magnificently. So let us go to the next slide. We know these four variables are the grape, the soil, the climate, the human culture, which includes law, viticulture, and human culture, the grape being the most important. But this lecture, we're going to be really focusing on the vitiviniculture, especially fortification. 
Uh, now, uh, last week we talked about another fortified wine, port. Well, there are several differences between port and sherry. Uh, first of all, let's go to the next slide. We know the most important variable is grapes, and we're not talking about Malbec Merlot. Well, the sherry grapes are Palomino Fino, Muscatel de Alejandra, and Pedro Jimenez. Now, you might remember the grapes last week from Port, and they were all red. These are all white. So, one big diff well, one big difference between port and sherry is that port's made in Portugal and sherry's made in Spain. Another big difference is that port is made from red wines and sherry is made from white wines. Okay, next slide, please. So here's Spain and sherry comes from right at the bottom. Uh, you know, uh, well, in the main region is called Andalusia or Andalusia. Next slide, please. And the most important, uh, the sherry region is what's called the Sherry Triangle. And these are two, three towns, Jerez de la Frontera, which was originally spelled I don't even know how to, Xerxes, I don't know how to pronounce this, but this, this was the, the X-E-R-E-S was the original spelling. El Puerto de Santa Maria and San Lucar de Betamida. These are the three main sherry producing towns. The latitude is 30, about 36 degrees north, which is about uh, St. Louis, and 21 inches of annual rainfall, uh, not a desert by any chance, uh, but uh, quite a bit drier than, for instance, Chicago. Okay, next slide, please. Well, I, sh I should, what does frontera sound like? Can somebody tell me what does frontera sound like? Frontier. Frontier, you are absolutely right, Deborah. And Hedeth de la, as a matter of fact, Christine, can you back up a little bit? Yep. So we know that whereas the Romans uh, pioneered and populated France, it was really the Moors that uh, populated Spain. But the Moors were pushed back to this town or this area, Jerez de la Frontera. And the person that pushed them back, next slide please, was El Cid. Uh, we can see that El Cid uh, and his lover are being portrayed here by those good Spaniards, Charlton Heston and Sophia Loren. <laughs> Uh, this was quite a spectacle of a movie. If you ever want to see a real, uh, you know, this was the era of Cleopatra and all those big epic movies. And boy, was this an epic. Uh, so El Cid, uh, also called the man, you know, El Cid is the master, translated the master. El Cid was the person who drove uh, the Moors uh, back to the frontera and eventually out of Spain entirely. Okay, next slide, please. Well, Andalusia or Andalusia, another film reference. I've got a lot of film references today. Uh, on the uh, left side of the screen <clears throat> is actually a breed of dog called, called an Andalusian dog. But does anybody know the seminal film by Louis Bunuel, The Andalusian Dog? I've seen it. Yeah, Gemma, not you. This was this. Yeah, if you're if you were a film student, you watched yep. this. Movie. Uh, this is a you know a very famous uh, surreal statement. 
uh, almost Dada in its statement. Should I, Christine, should you, should I tell what this, this? As I mean, just the, seeing the image, I'm like, it's giving me the creeps just seeing this still from it. Okay, well, let, let's, uh, let's, <laughs> we won't go into it, but if, if you, if, this is really one of the seminal uh, films, you can't even call it a movie. I mean, this is an important film. Yeah. Uh, if, if you ever want to see an important film, uh, this is one of the first, The Andalusian Dog. Okay, next slide, please. And of course, Andalusia is where uh, we associate flamenco, dancing. Now, another film I have to recommend, and this one is not like the Andalusian dog. This is called Lacho Drome, and it, it, it's a documentary tracing the origins of flamenco from Africa and India into Europe and especially Spain. And the interesting thing is there's almost no dialogue. Literally, there's there's about 10 words spoken in the entire film. It's all dance and music. And it is so, uh, you know, enrapturing. Uh, you, you just enter this world of this music and this rhythm. So if you ever uh, want to um, learn about the origins of flamenco, or just want to learn more about music and dance, uh, do search out, search, search out this movie, Lacho Jerome. Okay, another thing about uh, this part of the world are their festivals, their sherry festivals. And this is really like entering another world. You know, you go to this part of Spain, it really is like entering into a completely different culture. Um, these sherry festivals, um, in, in the festival grounds, uh, families, uh, not really business, yes, businesses, but also families, they set up these little tents. And the little, each little tent is like a little cafe that maybe will seat six people or eight people. And, well, you can see at the top, they're, they're flamenco performances. I mean, it's just the wackiest thing. And you just go from little tent to little tent, and you sit and you drink flamenco, and everybody's walking around, you know, just walking around in their beautiful garb. There's horses everywhere. It really, and of course, everybody is like drinking sherry. So it's like everyone's kind of hallucinating a little bit. Um, it really, if, if you know, if you're brave, because like I say, it is like entering into a, a, a completely different culture. Uh, if you ever really want an experience, seek out a sherry festival uh, in Andalusia or Andalusia. It's really an experience. Okay, so next slide, please. We'll talk, we'll start talking a little bit more about the wine now. So we've discussed the grapes. No need for you to remember any of those grapes. Unless you're taking your master sommelier exam, nobody knows what those grapes are. But the soil is a very specific type of soil called albariza. And of course, now that I know, remember that Roy is a geologist, I'm going to start putting the composition of the soil, which is calcium carbonate, clay, and silica. And it is absolutely white, uh, similar to the soil in champagne. I think this is even whiter than the soil in champagne. And of course the sun beat, you know, south of southern part of uh, Spain, right across from Africa, the sun beats down on this white, white, white soil. And then the heat is reflected back on the grapes. So the grapes 
get a lot of sunshine during the day and then also a lot of heat thrown back at them uh, at, in, the, in the nighttime. Okay, next slide, please. Now, we remember from our discussion of port, the port, sherry, vermouth, marsala, and a few other wines are fortified wines. And this emanated from the ancient science, art, magic, whatever you want to call it, of alchemy. And alchemy was brought to Europe, especially Spain and then Portugal, by the Moors. And alchemy is the science of, if you want to call it a science, of transmuting one element into another. <clears throat> so the big payoff was transmuting basic metal into gold and death into life. That was the big payoff. But uh, maybe the more profitable payoff was the invention, so to speak, of distilled spirits. Uh, of course, there was a lot of wine around, and the alchemist would take the wine and boil it. And we know what happens when we boil alcohol. Uh, the alcohol vaporizes before the water, and it creates kind of a shimmer in the air and the alchemist said oh that's a spirit i'm going to catch that spirit because i want to transmute this element from one element into the next i want to catch that spirit and so they cover the boiling pot which now we call the still and today what we see is a, a worm a screw-like looking thing so the vapor rises into the worm it goes through the goes through the worm and cools off and turns back into liquid <clears throat> and that liquid is now a distilled spirit uh so a wine in which almost all the water has been removed and wine just like you and me is mostly water so if you take all that water away you're left with the alcohol. And, uh, well, let's go ahead. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so a couple of terms to learn about sherry are floor and solera. So the wine is made, just the regular wine is made. And then, uh, remember, I used to represent uh, wines of Spain in the Midwest, so I was lucky enough to go to Spain uh, three times and go to the Sherry region twice. And what they tell you is that mysteriously, some barrels develop what's called floor. Christine, can you back up? And there it is. It's disgusting. It's a mold. Uh, there's no getting around it. It is disgusting. And they say that some, they say spontaneously. I don't think that's true. I think maybe some are inoculated, some aren't inoculated. Uh, but in Spain, they will tell you, oh, it's, it's, just, it's just nature which develops the floor. And this floor creates a situation called anaerobic fermentation, which is a fermentation. Yes, we've already got the wine, uh, but it's still fermenting a little bit. And this is a fermentation and an aging uh, without oxygen. And as the floor feeds off the wine, it also imparts a very specific, uh, I, I think the chemical is acid, acid aldehyde. Uh, in other wines, it's considered a fault. Uh, but in sherry, this is the traditional uh, flavor of sherry. 
So then the wine, so a, a third difference between port and sherry, port is fortified during fermentation. So the yeast has not eaten all the sugar. So port is inherently a sweet wine. Sherry, the yeast is allowed to eat all the sugar. So sherry is inherently a dry wine. It starts out as a dry wine. So certain casks develop this floor, then the wine is fortified, whether it's with distilled spirit or with, whether it's with brandy uh, from the very vineyard, and that kills the floor. The wine is siphoned off the floor and then goes into the solera. Now, if we could have the, uh, the next, uh, like the animation thing. Yes, perfect, perfect. So these soleras are... It, 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 it's just kind of unbelievable. Um, what they are, just what it looks like, piles and piles and piles and piles of barrels, and they go on for miles. And some soletas are hundreds of years old, over 100 years old. So how it works is... The youngest sherry is put into the top tier and it's left there for a particular amount of time. Then a certain amount of wine from the top tier is siphoned into the tier below and a certain amount of wine from the second to top tier is siphoned into the tier below that. And a certain amount of wine from the third tier is siphoned into the bottom tier. And then a certain amount of wine is actually pulled from the barrels to be put in battle. Uh, this is also called running the scales. It's also called, a solera is also called a, a criadera, which is nursery. Pardon me. And it's said the same as in a nursery. The older wines educate the new wine, and the new wine enlivens the old wine. So, as I say, some of these soletas, uh, as a matter of fact, it's not really unusual to have to find a soleta that was uh, established in 1870, let's say. And in theory, uh, even a bottle of wine that was bottled last year, in theory, contains, you know, a molecule uh, of wine from the original Soleta from the 1800s. It's, it's really a tremendous, uh, Yes, so, uh, okay, so, yes, so you start at the top tier. The, the barrels are kept about a, a, a third or seven-eighths full. So, the new wines are put in the top, but then whatever was in the barrel is siphoned into the barrel below that. And a certain amount that was in the barrel below that is siphoned into the barrel below that, and a certain amount is siphoned into the barrel below that. So it's remove and replace. Yes, we're removing and then we're putting it back in and we're removing it and putting it back in. And uh, it's also called fractional blending. Oh, okay. and, and Mary, the Solera, that's actually what the, like what the room or the space is called, right? That's what it is when you- The Soleta. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, you know, as I say, uh, here, let me... Well, um, 
you know, sometimes, uh, for instance, Tio Pepe. I don't know when Tio Pepe, but I mean, sometimes you pick up a bottle of uh, sherry and it says Solera established in 1856. Mm -hmm. That means that there have been wines in these barrels since 1856 and a molecule of the wine you're drinking today is from that original Solera. Okay, let me see. Huh, I'm looking at... Okay, good. Um, great. How long does this process take to pour from... That's the a very good bottom? question. Thank you. And uh, we're going to... And, and my next slide is going to uh, dis discuss that, uh, Asaf. Thank you very much. So here are types of sherry. And we're going about to discuss these types of sherry. And of course... The color comes from the time in the barrel, primarily from the time in the barrel. So you can see this tremendous range of color. Okay, next slide, please. So the basic type of sherry, I'm going to direct you to the second uh, bold. The very basic type of sherry is called pheno. Uh, it's dry, it's tangy, it's yeasty. Uh, like I say, it's got this kind of acetaldehyde. Uh, I mean, you got to love it, but, but I love it. Uh, and Asaf, to give you an idea, Fino runs the scales or is in the Soleta from two to ten years two to ten years. Okay, now right above pheno is a subcategory of pheno. And f let me say, pheno is the one you're going to get at all the tapas bars in town. Uh, that's really the basic sherry. I will say, uh, because of this, it's being exposed to oxygen, you know, it's being oxidized. And so, unlike other wines that may continue to develop in the bottle, Fino and Manthania, as soon as it comes out of the Soleta, starts to deteriorate. You know, it comes out of the... Uh, if you another movie reference, if you remember the movie The Time Machine and the Eloy, uh, the hero of the time machine falls in love with this beautiful creature and brings her back in the time machine. And when he brings her back to nowadays times, she turns into a horrible old hag. Well, it's kind of the same thing with Fino and Manthania. As soon as it comes out of its soleta, it starts to deteriorate. So, if you go to a tapas bar in Chicago or any restaurant and order a Fino or Manthania, it must be almost clear. If it's if it looks kind of, you know, yes, maybe a little tinge of maybe a little tinge of yellow, but if it's if it's brown, you send it back because that means it's been over the hill. When I go to a tapas restaurant, I say, oh, what's your top selling Fino or Manthania? What do you sell the most? And that's what I order, because I know that's going to move. Uh, Fino is fortified to 15 to 17% alcohol. Then we have a subcategory called Manthania. This is produced in one of those towns, San Lucar de Beramida. Um, they say that Manzanilla, uh, I'm sorry, I, I was cut off a little bit over here, uh, a salty sea spray quality. They say because it's San Lucar is on a bay that's on an ocean. And they say that the air uh while the wines are running the scales uh impart uh, a saltiness to manthania 
um, Manthania is considered to be just kind of a step up from floor, uh, I'm sorry, from Fino, uh, but it's also more uh, vulnerable and more, more delicate. Okay, then we go <clears throat> to Amontillado. And Amontillado is a Fino. It, it's left in the Solera for uh, four to six years. Then it's fortified to 16 to 20% alcohol. But then it's put back uh, into, into, into static, I think, into a different Solera, I think, I'm not sure it's a, a Solera that you run the scales. I think it's a Solera that you, you put the wine now into one barrel and you age it in one barrel. Uh, and Amontillados, so after they come out of the, sol the first Solera, four to six years, then they go into static aging then they're aged 10 to 50 more years in a barrel. I mean, can you imagine the cost of this, uh, holding these properties? Uh, so uh, sometimes uh, Amontillado is sweetened up a little bit. Uh, PX, Pedro Jimenez, is a very, very sweet grape. It's almost always called PX, if you see this. And so sometimes Amontillado is sweetened up. Sometimes it's very, very dry. These are, these are, you know, very uh, rich, uh, complex, you know, these, you know, a lot of very, very complex, rich, very powerful flavors. Okay. Another kind of sherry is called Oloroso. Now, this is a sherry. Once again, they say that this is completely uh, natural doing. Some sherry barrels never develop floor. And those sherry barrels are turned into Oloroso. Uh, Oloroso is aged uh, in Solera. Uh, from five to 25 years. Uh, I've only tasted Oloroso sweetened with PX, uh, but they're very, very powerful wines. Uh, again, fortified to 18 to 20% alcohol. Now, Paolo Cortado, uh, again, you know, the mystery, they keep talking about the mystery. Uh, for some reason, um, you have a barrel, it develops its floor, so it's, you know, it's assigned, oh, this is going to be a Fino or a Montiato, but with, with, for some reason, the floor dies. You know, once again, it's a mystery, they say, for some reason, the floor dies. Uh, and so they just leave it be in the barrel and it develops in the presence of oxygen. And let's see, I'm sorry, we're cut off. I think this is uh, also fortified to about 16 to 20% alcohol. Now we come um, to uh, a very well-known type of sherry called cream sherry. So this is an Oloroso, no floor, uh, and it's sweetened with PX, sweetened up to about, uh, I think 11% residual sugar is very conservative. Uh, I, I, you know, the most famous uh, cream sherry is dry sack. I think you should avoid it. Uh, it's just made in such huge quantity. Um, you know, it's, it, 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 it's just lost a little bit of its uh, quality. So I would avoid dry sack. Dry sack is very, very sweet. Uh, but there are some good cream sherries out there that are only delicately sweet. Uh, but I think most cream sherry is much sweeter than 11% residual sugar. 
And then finally, we've got PX or Pedro Jimenez. Now, this stuff is like molasses, uh, although it's kind of good. Uh, P, they take the grapes, they dry them on mats, uh, turn them into raisins, uh, partial fermentation, the juice is fortified. Uh, in fact, uh, very often uh, the, f the fermentation stops naturally because there's so much sugar in these uh, PX grapes that the yeast just kind of eats itself to death. So it doesn't really have to be fortified. But these are, uh, you know, these are, you know, these are not wines to be consumed in massive quantity. But uh, molasses, raisins, toffee, figs, I mean, with a, a dessert on its own or with a nut cake or poured over some hazelnut ice cream. Uh, you know, these are just fan fantastic. I mean, completely, completely decadent wines. Okay, next slide, please. You know what? Should we, um, are there any uh, questions or comments up? Uh oh, any questions or comments up to this point? Sorry. Uh, Christine, could you back up? Yep. Well, kind of like port, uh, England was Sherry's biggest customer. In 1587, Sir Francis Drake uh, responded to, uh, what are we calling it, military aggression uh, today in Ukraine, military, or I can't remember what we're, what we're calling, you know, that Russia is kind of moving closer to the Ukraine. Well, Spain was kind of making those same overtures on England. And so Sir Francis Drake uh, made a preemptive strike and caught the Spanish frigates in the port. And of course, the Spanish frigates were these big, huge fighting machines, and they were very powerful and deadly uh, fighting machines, but they couldn't maneuver, especially within port. And the English had the advantage because their ships were more agile. And so Sir Francis Drake sailed into Cadiz, Cadiz, pretty much destroyed uh, the Spanish Armada, and to, to salt the wounds, stole 3,000 butts or casks of sherry and brought them back to England, where uh, it got to be a very chic tipple uh, now, Christine, the next part of the uh, uh, animation. Come on. As a matter of fact, in 1597, one Sir John Falstaff, who was, you know, like the Jerry Seinfeld of uh, the 1500s, uh, a beloved character, said, if I had a thousand sons, the first humane principle I would teach them should be to forswear thin potations uh, and addict themselves to sack. Well, uh, sherry was called sack because, uh, also the word dry sack, because um, the barrels or the butts, so to speak, would be shipped to Portsmouth and then put in bottles. But of course, the bottles, uh, you know, this was before modern glass technology. This was before Dom Perignon, for instance, and they were very fragile. So the, the bottles would be wrapped in burlap sacks to protect them. So sherry became called sack and dry sack. This is where dry sack gets the name. Uh, but, um, oh, nice to see you, Asaf. Hi. So uh, sherry became a very, very chic uh, drink 
uh, popularized by uh, this very uh, popular character, Sir John Falstaff. Okay, next slide, please. Well, uh, you might have recognized the term amontillado uh, from this very chilling tale of horror by Edgar Allan Poe, The Cask of Amontillado. And this would have been a familiar topic in Baltimore and in the Young Americas because the only wine that could safely be shipped across the ocean was fortified wine. Non-fortified wine, the heat, the roiling in the, in the ships uh, would, you know, turn most wines bad. But the fortification and the little bit of sugar added would stabilize the wine. And so uh, most gentlemen of a certain class would own their own cask of Amontillado. They would contract for, you know, a whole cask or three casks that would be sent over to them to Baltimore or Philadelphia or wherever they were living. And so, uh, you know, certainly George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, you know, certainly all the founding fathers would have had their own casks of Amontillado. And uh, Edgar Allan Poe took that theme to write this chilling, chilling uh, tale of horror. I should also mention that uh, Sherry, uh, a cask of Sherry, was also a favorite murder weapon uh, for Shakespeare, because uh, the legend has it that evil King Richard III nailed his good brother Clarence. Uh, he had his good brother Clarence um, imprisoned in the Tower of London, and then he had him nailed into a cask of sherry. Uh, so uh, casks of sherry were uh, very popular uh, murder weapons. Um, another kind of film reference, if you ever want to hear uh, a magnificent uh, Shakespearean soliloquy on death and the contemplation of death, Clarence dreams of death, uh, and his murderers come in, unbeknownst to him, they're going to be his murderers, and he recounts this, this terrible dream he had about death. And if you rent the Sir Lawrence Olivier version of King Richard III, uh, none other than John Gielgud uh, speaks this uh, soliloquy. And it's really one of the most beautiful, eloquent statements on uh, existence and death, uh, you know, you know, good times, right? Good times. Okay. Next, please. So we in this country associate sherry with tapas. Now, has anybody here been to Spain? Yes. Did you go to any tapas bars, Deborah? Yes. Several. Oh. <laughs> several? It's wacky, isn't it? It's great. <laughs> It's you, it, it, yeah, you know. You can eat it all day long, even for breakfast. It's fantastic. But if you eat it for breakfast, you're probably eating with people who haven't ended from the night before. Could be, could be. right? Because you go out, you know. Uh, when I was uninitiated, uh, you know, I'd say, "Where should I go to eat in Spain?" And they'd and I'd go to these dining areas at six or seven o'clock and say, boy, I must really look like a rube. I have been uh, really sent to a, you know, where is everybody? Uh, and then I'd be done at like eight o'clock at night and these places would just be so opening. hell, right? Yeah. 
I never heard anyone order sherry though in any of these uh, places. Were you in the southern part of Spain? Actually, no, I was in the northern part. In uh, yeah, I was in the northern part. I'm Maybe trying to they were where I was. <laughs> Maybe they were drinking cava. Were they uh, drinking yes. cava and yeah, red wine and cava? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, this is primarily in the southern part. Southern. Okay, Andalusia. Uh, but you, but you know the you know the the how, you know it's just amazing, isn't yeah. it? And, and the waiter never takes he never writes down your order in it, and and you don't pay until the very end. And they all seem to know, they know what you had consumed. Uh, amazing, it's and amazing. They write it down, yeah. So, so this, so this is really a fun fun way to eat. I'm sorry that uh, in America, uh, people have really kind of capitalized on it. I think it's a, to go out for tapas in this country, I think is a little expensive. Uh, people don't realize if you order 10 tapas, you know, it's going to start to add up. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when I was representing the commercial office of Spain, uh, Tapas had just come to Chicago. Uh, Cafe Babariba had just opened. And Cafe Iberico just opened. And there was another uh, chef who left Cafe Babariba, Cafe Babariba and Chef Gabino. Uh, I, can't, I can't even remember this guy's name. Does any, Christine, do you remember the Spanish chef? No. He had a whole chain of tapas restaurants in the western suburbs. Uh, but this was, you know, what a fun way to eat and drink. Of course, if you're eating, uh, if you're having the richer tapas, uh, sherries, if you're having uh, Oloroso, Amontillado, uh, certainly Paulo Cortado, uh, you're looking at foods more like know grilled pork or a goose you know uh sherry amontillado is probably what you know uh during the charles dickens time uh you would be having your roast goose with amontillado or oloroso uh and of course the sweeter types the px uh and sweeter oloroso uh, as I say, for nut cakes, pour over ice cream, uh, very, very decadent. Okay, and I think that brings us to the end of this. Uh, well, that was fun, wasn't it? Of course. I just yes. have so many happy <laughs> memories of drinking sherry, uh, going to flamenco bars and... Uh, you know, uh, so any, any comments or questions about Sherry? Oh, I should mention that if you go to a retailer and you buy, especially if you buy Fino or Manzanilla, first of all, Tio Pepe is by miles the top selling Fino in the United States by miles. So that would be the safe sherry to purchase. And I also recommend purchasing it in half bottles. Uh, otherwise, I would really recommend purchasing your sherry from a retailer that you know uh and that sells sherry because like i say both fino and manzanilla deteriorate i think tio pepe goes as far as to uh put the date mm. the wine was uh bottled so that will ensure freshness um what else was i gonna say i can't remember does anyone know of a restaurant or a bar that kind of specializes in Spanish wines and sherries and that, that you could walk in and well, get a stale bottle? Well, the thing is, uh, 
I would say Cafe Babariba, uh, but um, I don't want to say this on the air, but uh, sometimes these restaurants just really don't care for their sherries like they should. Yeah. So this is the problem. I would say a tapas restaurant would be the safest. But once again, uh, if the bottle, if, if there's an open bottle sitting on a back bar, you know immediately it's not going to be any good. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is, this is what has really hurt uh, sherry sales in the United States because, uh, uh, because uh, it, no one really understands how to manage it. Well, dry sack. Another, dry sack is the only familiar, you know, I remember buying a bottle of dry sack to try sherry. And, you know, I think I bought one bottle and never bought another one again. Yeah, good. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. And then, of course, cooking sherry, avoid it like infectious disease, you know, yeah. avoid it. Uh, salt and additives. Yeah. Uh, but like I say, I've got a bottle of sherry here and I, I almost put it in the freezer to get it ready. And, oh, but once I start on sherry, I have a very hard time stopping. So I didn't. <laughs> He's very I you, this week, folks. So could you get could you give us recommendations on, on what brands? Cause I, you know, cause we have Sherry. We always have a bottle of Sherry in the house, but every time I go back and I go to Benny's and every time I go back, it's gone. <laughs> it's something else. And I'm, I'm just, well, I'm, I see what you mean. I'm very overwhelmed. I'm like, Oh, I don't, I don't. And I, I, we like most of these, I mean, it will switch, but I'm like, Oh, I really like this one. They don't have it anymore. And, yeah. and, and I feel like the, the, the sellers that are there, they're so focused on just more traditional wine. Yeah. I'm like, okay. I'm, 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 always, I'm always stumped when I go to buy something from that area. Well, one brand uh, that I've had, I, I as we checked, uh, have a couple of wines placed at the chopping block is Valdespino. V A L D E. S-P-I-N-O, Val Despino. And I'll tell you that the distributor is Cream, Cream Wine Company. And hold on, let me, I want to get my bottle. There's something. Huh. Well, no, this is, uh, I thought there was something. Now, look, this, this Soleta was established in 1430. Ooh. Yeah. Um, I thought there was some little tiny bit of difference that this was a little bit diff a different place. But no, this is saying it's... Uh, Kedeth, here the uh, the fino is called Innocente. The cream is quite good. It's only delicately sweet, and the cream is called Isabella, Isabella cream. But as I say, this is represented in in Illinois by the distributor Cream Wine Company, and they're a very well respected. Um, Distributor, so you might have a little bit of luck with this. Great, thank you. Yeah. Another name, another big name is Emilio Emilio Lustau. Yeah. I'm not. He that was the big name. I'm not sure. Maybe I just didn't understand the wines, but I wasn't. As not people were nuts about these wines. I wasn't as nuts about them, but that was that's just one girl's opinion. Yeah, I, and that's the one that I see. So I just get nervous if that's the one I always see. It's like why it's always there or something. It's all yes, yeah. yeah. 
Any other questions? Oh. What are we doing next week? Next week, we are going to be refreshing our brains on Cabernet Sauvignon. Okay. In preparation for a Cabernet Sauvignon tasting. Oh, good. So, good. yeah. So more details to come on the tasting and the regions that Mary is going to recommend that you pick up a bottle each from both. So we're both tasting two different regions. Um, that produce Cabernet Sauvignon. And um, next week will be our little session where we can make sure we are mentally prepared uh, and then get our taste buds ready for the week after that. So I, I do have to add that uh, Mary, over the weekend, someone made one of your famous desserts for me that consisted of a little glass filled with uh, cut up uh, berries and vanilla ice cream and port poured over it. It was delicious. And I had to follow it up with a glass of port too to wash it down, but it was, it was delicious. So we, and we thought of you the whole time we ate it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, Makes me great feel dessert. good. Great, easy dessert. Um, also, just a little note to everyone as well. Uh, you may have seen in the email that went out today. Now, Friday, we do have Saruthi, who will be at our regular time, 4.30. She's going to be doing chicken kati rolls. But next week's Monday um, with Marty and Wednesday with Mary will actually be at 5 o'clock p.m. So because I have a, another session I will be doing with some other folks prior to that. So thank you, Mary, for being flexible. Thank and you. I hope this works with all of your schedules as well. So um, I have something to add when you turn the recording off. Absolutely. So thank you so much for joining us, everyone. And we hope to see you the next time. Have a fantastic evening.